All right, part seven of our electrophysiology lectures. We're going to be talking about the autonomic nervous system and how it influences the heart. So we all know that if somebody jumps out and scares you, your heart speeds up and it's your brain that's essentially causing that to happen. So how do messages from our brain, like I'm scared or I'm relaxed, uh, turn into changes in how our heart functions. And that's what this lecture is going to be all about, the autonomic nervous system influence on the heart. So, uh, you know about this stuff, go to paramedicine.com, you can find out more, download the PowerPoint, all that sort of stuff. We're almost done. This is our penultimate lecture. So we're going to be talking about the ANS influence. The last um, lecture that we're going to be doing here, lecture number eight, is going to be about paramedic pharmacology. So really, this, this is the last lecture where we're talking a lot about the ion flow. We'll apply that in the last lecture, in lecture number eight. But in this lecture number seven, we're kind of wrapping up, in a way, our discussion of how the heart works. So by the end of this lecture, here are the answers, or the questions that you should be able to answer. You should have a pretty good understanding of the nervous system because we're talking about the nervous system and how it influences the heart. So you should understand sort of the layout of the autonomic nervous system, being able to use those terms. You should be able to define inotropy, chronotropy, dromotropy, and irritability. And uh, you should be able to differentiate between how the atria and the ventricle are innerva innervated by the autonomic nervous system because it's different. And we'll discuss that. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, five important factors or categories of factors that influence our autonomic tone, whether we're excited or relaxed. And finally, there's a, a kind of a good summative diagram for all of this that we've done so far up to this lecture that summarizes all the information. And that diagram is one that my students print out on a laminated sheet and fill in over and over and over again in preparation for the exam, because usually something like this is on the exam, because I want to know that you understand electrophysiology if you're going to be studying and working with people's hearts. Okay, last one is going to be labeling this diagram, and this is the diagram. So if you can do this diagram, if you can fill this in, you're going all the way from the left side talking about uh, the autonomic nervous system and the factors that influence the heart rate going then from the brain down to the myocytes and then inside the myocytes and how the myocytes work. So download the PowerPoint from SlideShare, um, which you can get if you go to the paramedicine.com website. There's a page here that has all of these lectures listed and links to all of the slides. So you can go and download the slide, print this slide up and practice, 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 practice. Make sure you get this stuff down. Okay. All right, so the autonomic nervous system. Um, I won't do this too much because I've done another lecture on YouTube talking about the autonomic nervous system, which I'll link to in a second. But basically, on the left here, you've got your peripheral nervous system, and on the right, you've got the central nervous system. Central nervous system is brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is everything that comes off of the spinal cord and into the rest of the body. And when we take a look at the peripheral nervous system, we break it down into two. The efferent nervous system, which acts on things, and the afferent nervous system, which is sensory. So smelling, vision, touch, taste, uh, sound, all of that sort of stuff is the afferent nervous system. And sometimes people can't remember which is which, so a great mnemonic is they're the same. The sensory is afferent, we call it afferent, that's a fancy name, and the motor is efferent. So if I want to wiggle my fingers, it's going to go from my central nervous system down through my spine, out through motor nerves, the efferent nervous system, into the somatic nervous system, soma meaning body, so that's how I affect my body, and that's how I can consciously move things with the somatic nervous system. I can make you know, whatever sort of movements I want, working through my somatic nervous system. But parallel to the somatic nervous system is something called the autonomic nervous system, or the ANS. And that autonomic nervous system controls the automatic stuff inside of our body. So for example, when I eat food, I consciously think about chewing the food, if I'm paying attention to my eating, which I often don't. But if I'm paying attention to my eating, I think about chewing and I think about, okay, I'm ready to swallow and then I swallow it. And then I don't think about it anymore. It sits in my stomach until somehow automatically it moves from my stomach into my duodenum and then down through the rest of my digestive system. 
And if I'm a baby, it just comes out on its own. As an adult, I go, oh, I think I'm ready. And I consciously decide to go to the toilet. But my somatic nervous system takes over at that point. But we got to learn how to do that. So the autonomic nervous system is the automatic type of stuff. Again, when I eat food, I don't think, oh, I should pump out six units of insulin. My, my body just does that automatically. <clears throat> growth, all sorts of stuff is, is, well, growth not so much, but a lot of autonomic automatic functions are done by the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system generally operates in, you can say roughly, two speeds. <clears throat> and the first speed is excited, anxious, uh, aggressive. Uh, when we're attacked by something, we switch into the, the active part of our autonomic nervous system, which we call the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is also often called the fight and flight, fight or flight. So you might have heard people talking about the fight or flight system in your body. That's the sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system. And at other times, after dinner, when we're sitting around the campfire, playing guitar, nice and relaxed, everything is, uh, you know, we call it the rest and digest portion of our autonomic nervous system. That's called officially the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the thing about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system is that they're like a teeter-totter. You can have one or the other. And if you turn on one really strong, the other turns off. Turn on this one really strong, the other turns off. If you block this one and turn it off, the other will turn on. Or if you block this one and turn it off, this one will turn on. So something that turns on the sympathetic nervous system is called a sympathomimetic. It stim simulates the sympathetic nervous system. Something that turns off the sympathetic system is called a sympatholytic. It cuts the sympathetic nervous system. Similarly, fancy words, we have parasympathomimetics, which mimic or turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. And we have parasympatholytics, which cut or turn off the parasympathetic nervous system. So we can turn on or turn off one or the other, which usually entails the other becoming more dominant, like a teeter-totter. Okay. So most of our involuntary organs and glands, sweating, I don't think about sweating, I just sweat. They'll have both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, which means nerves going to them. The SNS, sympathetic nervous system, and the PSNS, parasympathetic nervous system, act antagonistically, so they fight each other. Someone has to be in charge to maintain homeostasis or quickly get us back into homeostasis. Sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest. Again, if you're not as up on this, uh, and if you're going, what, what are you talking about? You might want to stop at this point and go watch my lecture on the autonomic nervous system. So I go through the, the, the autonomic nervous system in detail for about half an hour. <clears throat> and it's a good lecture to know. It's really basic information because a lot of what we do as paramedics is manipulating the autonomic nervous system, either getting people who are dying to turn on their sympathetic nervous system so that their intrinsic mechanisms can save themselves, or people who are too freaked out, we turn off the sympathetic nervous system, turn on the parasympathetic nervous system to relax them so that they don't freak out too much. So playing with the autonomic nervous system is a big part of emergency medicine and a big part of you know resuscitation and paramedicine. So make sure you're okay with the autonomic nervous system, okay? Because we're going to get into it more now. Because we're talking about anus influence. So sympathetic stimulation. How does this work? Well, we've got our brain. Well, this guy doesn't have a brain. <laughs> They've cut off the brain. But imagine that the top, they got a brain stem. The top part of the brain is here as well. And um, I jump out and say, boo, and you get scared. So what happens is our brain goes, yikes, I'm scared, and sends... Uh, signals down the um, spinal cord and those signals will exit the spinal cord at some point uh, going from the spinal cord through nerves here and hit ganglia and this is called the ganglionic chain the sympathetic ganglionic chain it's all these ganglia or you can think of them as roundabouts <clears throat> where the signal comes in and then gets transmitted again from these ganglia now off to the heart. And you can see there's multiple ways that we innervate the heart, but specifically the sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight system can speed up our atria 
and can speed up our ventricles. The parasympathetic nervous system can't do that. The parasympathetic nervous system only slows down the atria. It doesn't go to the top and the bottom. It just goes to the top. That makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, what's going to save you is being able to react to a dangerous stimuli and either beating it up or running away and escaping. So our body errs on the side of overstimulating the heart and getting it really going so that we can save ourselves. So when our brain says, hey, let's turn on the sympathetic nervous system, the way I sometimes think about this is it's sending a signal from here down to here. This is like a high-speed train with a lot of different stations. So the signal, the brain hands the, you know, the envelope to a messenger, and the messenger hops on the train and goes down the train, gets off at the right station, and then hops in a car, drives along this pre-ganglionic nerve road, gets into a roundabout, decides where they want to go, gets out of the roundabout, drives off to the heart, and delivers their message. And in the case of the sympathetic nervous system, in the case of a message that is speed up, they deliver the message both to the atria and the ventricles. And what does that message do? It does a few things. It increases the heart rate, so we beat more times a minute. It increases the conduction velocity through the heart, so the signals get from the atria down to the ventricles faster. It also increases the strength of contraction. So the actin myosin squeeze, that power stroke that's going on, there's more actin and myosin contracting, and they're doing so more powerfully. So we get a really good, strong squeeze. And that's where these terms come in chronotropy, dromotropy, and inotropy. So chronos was the Greek god of time. The chronometer is the proper name for a watch. So chrono means time. So more beats per time means a faster heart rate. That's chronotropy. Dromotropy, dromo comes from Greek, I think, and it's path. So it's the path, and the path is easier to travel. So we speed up, and we get a faster conduction pathway. And inotropy, ino meaning strength, is the strength of the contraction. So sympathetic uh, nervous innervation causes increased heart rate, increased um, conduction velocity, increased strength of contraction. Cro increased their positive chronotropes, dromotropes, and inotropes. So if we have a drug like uh, adrenaline, which is the classic, or epinephrine for the Americans, which is the classic drug that stimulates the autonomic nervous system, we say adrenaline is a positive inotrope, a positive chronotrope, and a positive dromotrope. Adrenaline also, like all the other sympathetic stimulants, all the other sympathomimetics, will increase irritability. So if I had a patient and I decided to be a particularly, you know, cruel paramedic and I wanted to torture them, I could give them too much adrenaline. If I give them too much, what I'm going to start to see is a whole bunch of ventricular ectopy coming up and, you know, multifocal, frequent, um, uh, premature ventricular contractions. So PVCs, or not contractions, because they don't technically contract. They call them complexes now. I'm still old school. So PVCs, we now say, stand for premature ventricular complexes because the heart may or may not be contracting with them. Anyway, so that's sympathetic stimulation, and that's chronotropy, dromotropy, and inotropy. Important terms to know when we're talking about ANS medications because they tell us what's happening to the heart. We can switch over to the parasympathetic nervous system now. And the parasympathetic nervous system is a similar type of system. We've got our brain and our brain stem, and we transmit signals from the, the spinal cord and from upper parts of the brain, particularly the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve. And uh, those signals come out, <clears throat> they go into a ganglion, oops, in this case, the uh, vagus nerve comes down here, to a cardiac ganglia. And as you can see, the postganglionic neuron only goes to the atria not to the ventricles. So the way you can think about this is that the gas pedal, when we hit the gas pedal, the sympathetic nervous system, it accelerates the atria and the ventricles. But when we hit the brake, it only stimulates the atria because our body doesn't want to stop our ventricles because the ventricles keep us alive. We can try to slow down the heart, but if we're really in a desperate situation and we've released a lot of adrenaline and we're trying to calm ourselves down, our body is going to say, I'm not going to be calmed down. 
I'm going to keep pumping those ventricles. And this is important because one of the techniques that paramedics do is called a vagal maneuver. Vagus comes from the vagus nerve. So what we're doing is we're, we're manually stimulating the vagus nerve by doing a carotid sinus massage and pressing on, you press in, you hold it for about 10 seconds, rub a little bit, and then let go suddenly. And it's the release that fires off the vagus nerve, which then sends an influence or sends a signal down to the atria and slows the atria down. I think of the vagus nerve as the parking brake of the heart. So we're stimulating the parking brake by rubbing on the carotid sinus. That slows the atria down, but it doesn't slow the ventricle down, which is really, really important to understand. Because if your patient is in a supraventricular tachycardia and you want to slow them down, this will work because the nerve goes to the atria. But if they're in a ventricular tachycardia and you want to slow them down, this won't work because you're putting the brake on the atria and it's not the atria that are running away. It's the ventricles that are running away. So carotid sinus massage and vagal maneuvers, you know, blowing into the syringe or whatever you do, uh, are gonna slow down supraventricular rhythms, tachycardias, but they're not gonna slow down ventricular tachycardias. And that's a really important clinical point to remember. Please don't be the paramedic who's doing vagal maneuvers on ventricular tachycardia, because it's not gonna work. So, Parasympathetic nervous system innervates only the atria. And uh, parasympathetic agents, parasympa parasympathomimetics, will be negative chronotropes, negative dronotropes, and negative inotropes, and they will decrease irritability. So very useful functional drugs for us to have. If we want to speed up the heart, which is going too slow, strengthen the heart, which is too weak, or if we want to slow down a heart, which is going too fast, or calm down a heart, which is squeezing too powerfully. We tend not to do that so much, but we do speed up and slow down the heart a fair bit. So that's how the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system communicate and connect down to the heart. So the important part is the brake only breaks the atria. The gas pedal will accelerate both the atria and the ventricles. And that's why we have to be careful when we're doing carotid sinus massage, because this doesn't work on the ventricles. Stimulating the vagus nerve doesn't do anything to the ventricles because the vagus nerve doesn't innervate the ventricles, just the atria. Okay, so here's our really important con concept to understand. So the sympathetic nervous system will stimulate the contractile cells of the atria and the ventricles They'll stimulate the AV nodes to speed up the conduction and uh, decrease, in the case of the sympathetic nervous system, the refractory period so that they can fire off a little bit more. It also makes the SA node speed up, makes the AV node speed up, makes the atria speed up, and speeds up the ventricular conduction system. The parasympathetic nervous system doesn't quite do all of that. So it does affect the cells of the atria, but it doesn't affect the cells of the ventricular myocardium. Uh, it does affect the AV nodal cells, and it can slow down the SA node and the AV node and slow down the atria, but it doesn't slow down the ventricular conduction system, okay? So the gas speeds everything up. The brake just slows down the atria. Important, fundamental, physiological concept. So what turns on the sympathetic nervous system? What turns it off? What turns on the parasympathetic nervous system? What turns it off? Well, you know the answer to that because you know what makes you anxious and you know what makes you relax. Being safe makes us feel relaxed. Being threatened makes us feel anxious. So if I were to tell you that there's a test on this, uh, as soon as we're done, there's a courier's going to show up with a big exam and give you that. And if you fail that exam, you will never, ever be a paramedic in your life you'd start to freak out. Your thinking, your cerebral cortex will affect your heart rate. So that can affect us. Uh, if you were to, our thinking affects us. We, we've all had sleepless nights because we were worrying about something and we're slightly tachycardic. It's our cerebral cortex doing that. We've all told ourselves, calm down, man. It's okay. And as soon as you do that, you start to switch into your parasympathetic nervous system. Our hypothalamus is sort of the unconscious controller of our autonomic nervous system, our autonomic balance. So if, um, I don't know, if you meet someone and you fall in love and you go, 
I love them so much. Your heart rate speeds up, your pupils dilate. You get sympathetic, and we can see it. That's incidentally why we think that people with blue eyes tend to be more attractive than people with dark eyes, because we can see the autonomic balance change. So if you meet someone with light-colored eyes, and you're talking to them, and their pupils start to dilate, uh, they're either afraid of you or they're in love with you. And if they're smiling at you, they're maybe they're in love with you. So that's one of the reasons from an evolutionary psychology point of view. And people with dark eyes, we consider more inscrutable. We can't tell. Bit of a tangent. But anyway, so our hypothalamus, our emotional state can change our heart rate as well, which we know. The second major area is our circulatory regulation. So our uh, how much blood is coming back to the heart. If we're not getting enough blood coming back to the heart and our baroreceptors sense that we're hypotensive, we go, uh-oh, uh we're not getting enough blood. So let's make the heart pump faster. Maybe that's the problem. It's either the pump, the heart, or the pipes, uh, or the pump, the pipes, or the volume. So it, we can affect the heart. Let's speed the heart up, and we'll also you know, squeeze the blood vessels a little bit. When we stimulate our sympathetic nervous system, we increase our vasomotor tone, and we constrict our blood vessels, especially out in the periphery. That's why people who are really, really anxious and really, really scared go pale, because we're shutting down the peripheral um, uh, vasomotor uh, perfusion and keeping it in the core, so our brains, our heart, our kidneys, and our major muscles have blood to work. So the blood pressure, essentially, our circulatory regulation will do that. Respiratory regulation is also a really important one. And it's a really cool one because it's the only one where the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system overlap. So normally, like right now, I'm not thinking about my breathing. I just sort of automatically breathe when I run out of breath. But if I wanted to, I could start to speed up my breathing. And when I intentionally, volitionally speed up my breathing, I start to get more nervous. And you could do this yourself as an experiment. What you do is you tighten up your muscles and you grimace and you go. And you do that not too long and it'll pass out because you're hyperventilating. But just do that a little bit and you can feel yourself getting, you know, tighten up your shoulders and you can turn on your sympathetic ner nervous system. You can also turn it off. And this is something in medicine that we call tactical breathing. So when you are, for example, running a cardiac arrest and you're nervous and you're finding yourself uh, doing this and, okay, can I get, um, we got to defibrillate, we got to, and you're like, and you're all, all the energy comes up here. You volitionally slow down your breathing, drop your shoulders and deepen your breathing. Change from <laughs> to And breathe, as they say in, in martial arts, from the hara, underneath the belly button. Feel the breath coming down there, and you calm down. And when you calm down, you can think more clearly. Because when our sympathetic nervous system takes over, and our cerebral cortex shuts down, we can't think as well, we can't remember as well, and we can't lay down memories as well, which is why as an educator, I know that if my students are scared, they're not going to learn. If I go into a tutorial and ask someone a question and they give the wrong answer, I go, no, that's the wrong answer. You're stupid. Is there any smart students in this class anywhere? You know, that sort of drill sergeant form of teaching does not work because it puts people into sympathetic nervous system, they go limbic, the cerebral cortex shuts down, and they're not learning, they're just scared. As there's an old saying, um, one of my colleagues, Scott Stewart, has this up on his wall. Uh, you can't do the Bloom stuff until you've done the Maslow stuff. And I think that's a great summary because Bloom's taxonomy is, you know, the level we're teaching at. But Maslow's hierarchy of needs is if you, you got to be safe, you got to be well fed, you got to feel appreciated, all that sort of stuff. So you got to make sure people feel safe before they can do anything else. Okay. Anyway, uh, the, the, the other concise expression I like about that is nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. And if you're a teacher up there just being a horrible person, nobody's going to care about what you're teaching and they're going to feel too threatened to be able to learn. So when you're feeling threatened, when you're in class and the teacher is just going past you, tactical breathing. Okay, calm down. I can do this. Let's slowly approach this step by step. Okay, first things first. And you'll need to do that as a paramedic as well, because you're going to walk into some horrific scenes and go, and you got to go, 
Oops. Okay. Can somebody pick up the arm over there? Somebody stop the bleeding. Somebody stop the vehicles from coming at us. And you, that's how you maintain control. And that autonomic tone is contagious. It's really important for us to understand that too. If you walk into a scene and, you know, someone's arm's been ripped off or whatever, and you go, oh my God, everybody freaks out. If the paramedics freak out, everybody freaks out. But if you walk in and say, okay, guys, here's what we need to do. Here's the plan. Everybody goes, okay, okay. And they catch your autonomic tone. All right. So other somatic regulation, as you know, if, um, if you're in pain, your heart rate's going to speed up. If you're overwhelmed thermically, you know, if you're too hot, your heart rate's going to speed up. Uh, if you tense up your muscles, then you stimulate your sympathetic nervous system and your heart will speed up. So we can do that as well through our body. That's another major area that we can influence our autonomic nervous system. And then there's chemical regulation. So if we're hypoxic, if we're acidotic, if we um, release endogenous hormones in our body, like adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, or epinephrine, thyroxin, histamine, all those sorts of drugs, poisons and other drugs that we can take extrinsically, those can change us from sympathetic to parasympathetic or from parasympathetic to sympathetic. So we can control our autonomic balance through a factors of sort of uncontrollable things and other controllable things. And working in a high stress mission critical environment like emergency medicine, paramedicine, you need to learn to control your autonomic nervous system. That is a fundamental skill. One of the things about paramedics that makes us different than other people is we walk in when everybody else is running out. We take control of situations that make other people curl up into, you know, the fetal position and suck their thumb because we can control our autonomic nervous system. And if you can't do that, if you freak out at calls, you, you can't be a paramedic. You've got to be able to control your own autonomic nervous system. Okay. So what controls the autonomic balance? Well, we can get a whole bunch of factors. What we're thinking, what we're feeling, what our hypothalamus is doing, our blood pressure, respiration, all these things will control uh, the input into our brain. And that will get into the brain and the brain will then stimulate a part of the brainstem called the medulla oblongata or just the medulla. And the medulla is back down here and it controls a bunch of basic functions. It controls our vasomotor tone. It controls a lot of our respiratory pattern. It controls our heart rate. Um, that's why when we have trauma and our brain is swelling and it starts pushing our brain down through the foramen magnum, the coning at the bottom of our brain, all of those basic functions like breathing and blood pressure and heart rate get all messed up because the medulla oblongata is being squeezed down through the foramen magnum and squeezing it affects how the neurons are able to work. So in the medulla oblongata, we have two particular areas called, you know, obviously the cardiac acceleratory center and the cardiac inhibitory center. So all these things on the left side of the screen affect our brain. Our brain then communicates with the medulla oblongata and says, dude, speed up the heart. We're in trouble. Or, dude, relax. The heart is, we're, we're all fine here. Just slow the heart down. We're, we're, we're resting and digesting here. So that's how we take external sort of factors or body somatic factors and get the message down to our heart, or at least start sending the message to the heart. So we've gotten from somebody telling you terrible news through your brain to the medulla oblongata and to the inhibitory or the acceleratory centers. And then somehow those things have to communicate with the heart. How does that work? Well, let's keep on passing along here. So the medulla oblongata has the inhibitory and the acceleratory center. Inhibitory parasympathetic nervous system is usually um, uh, written in blue or represented in blue and the sympathetic is usually written in red. So I just stuck with that convention. So in the acceleratory center, it's going to stimulate one of the sympathetic preganglionic neurons. So it'll go down the spinal column, out the spinal column into a preganglionic neuron, into one of those ganglia in the sympathetic chain, down through a postganglionic nerve and eventually arrive at the heart. The inhibitory center is going to go through either the right or the left vagus nerve. That's the specific nerve that it uses. It's much more specific than in the sympathetic nervous system. It's the cardiac plexus, the, the ganglia of nerves 
just before the heart, go through a postganglionic nerve, and then go to the heart. There's our heart. So, as a summary, you can take a look at that slide. There's our sympathetic nervous system with the sympathetic nervous system ganglia chain and the parasympathetic nervous system with the cardiac plexus coming off the vagus nerve there, both then affecting the heart. All right. Now, we've sent a message right up to the, the cell wall of the heart. We've got the signal arriving. But how does that signal arriving at the heart then actually change what's happening inside the cells of the heart. How do we bridge that gap from the neurons into the actual cells themselves? It's not magic. The answer is, as it is in most of cardiology, something's happening with ions. And as I said, I think in the first lecture, if you can go down to the ionic level, then you understand the heart. If, uh, if you can bring it down to what is sodium, potassium, and calcium doing, then I'm convinced that you understand. And often when we do um, projects in my classes, I say, I want you to explain this at the molecular level. And what I'm doing is, is saying, go back to ions. So let's talk about ions. Let's connect this bit, the external stuff affecting our autonomic nervous system, and coming into our heart, so what it's doing to this diagram again, this fundamental diagram of how it's doing it. So when we go through the sympathetic nervous system and our cardiac acceleratory center hits along here, by the time we get to the axon of the postganglionic nerve, the bit that acts on something else, the axon, then we have a neurotransmitter released. And that neurotransmitter is, depending on which side of the ocean you're on, noradrenaline or norepinephrine. So here, where I'm in Australia, we call it noradrenaline. Same, same hormone, just a slightly different name. And if you want to know why they've got different names, go on to whatever podcasting you use. I've got a podcast there called All About Pharmacology, and I talk about Jokichi Takamini, the guy who actually discovered adrenaline first, and uh, John Abel, the American who discovered it label later, and I explain it. Anyways, I'm going to call it noradrenaline, call it norepinephrine if you want, but the postganglionic nerve axon releases noradrenaline, and noradrenaline spits across this gap and hits a receptor specific for noradrenaline. And that receptor is called the beta-1 receptor. Sometimes you call it a beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which means it's the adrenaline uh, receptor. And then stuff happens inside the cell, which we'll talk about in a second. If the cardiac inhibitory center is stimulated, then we go down the vagus nerve, cardiac ganglia, postganglionic nerve, and the axon spits out instead some acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that acetylcholine spits across into a different receptor, and this receptor is called a muscarinic 2 receptor. So acetylcholine goes into muscarinic 2, noradrenaline goes into beta 1 receptors. And that causes a cascade of things to happen inside the cell, which we'll talk about. But that, the noradrenaline and the acetylcholine, is how we bridge from the nervous system into the actual change of function in the heart cell itself. So it's important to know about those drugs and know how they work and know about those receptors because we play with those receptors. If we want to speed up somebody's heart, we give a drug that is a beta-1 adrenergic agonist. So what we do is we're saying we're giving a drug which is going to hit that beta-1 receptor and cause the heart to speed up. If we want to slow down the heart, for example, then we can give a cardioselective beta blocker, which blocks that beta receptor and makes it impossible for all of that cascade of stuff to happen inside the heart, which changes how the heart cell works. So this is kind of like the doorbell or the intercom, and noradrenaline is the intercom saying, hey, speed up, and there's a different intercom where acetylcholine can hit the button and say, hey, slow down. 
So we got to understand that because a lot of our drugs work on those receptors. We play more with the beta receptors and the sympathetic than we do with the muscarinic and the parasympathetic. But a lot of toxins and stuff will hit muscarinic receptors. So it, it has physiological effects. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to get into this, but the, there are also some muscarinic receptors on the um, preterminal axon of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nerves. So when we release a lot of acetylcholine, there's a bit of a feedback mechanism that slows the noradrenaline down. Interesting, but n not essential, okay? So I've scared you, or you've fallen in love with me, or you know whatever you do. I've stimulated your autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has said, okay, we're gonna go sympathetic here. We've gone down the sympathetic pathway and we've released some noradrenaline and it's hit our beta-1 receptor. And the beta-1 receptor is now going to activate some secondary messenger systems, which are going to start affecting the um, voltage-gated channels and it's going to affect our pumps and it's going to affect our exchangers. How does that work? This is kind of a dense slide, but just stick with me because it's not too tough. So the first thing that happens is the secondary messenger systems, and I'm not going to go into detail of the secondary messenger systems because you can, you know, you can go too far down the hole. Just know that the secondary messenger systems then start to simulate these pumps and they speed them up. So the pumps start to work faster. And as the pumps work faster and we get more ions moving to either side here, depending on the concentration gradient, then these exchangers start to speed up as well. What that means is that the heart pumps more quickly and resets more quickly, so we increase our heart rate. And that's how any sort of sympathetic stimulation or uh, sympathomimetic acts as a positive chronotrope. It speeds up the pumps and that speeds up the exchangers, which means the heart can go faster. Second thing that happens is that these ion channels work more quickly and they move the ions through more quickly. And since they're the, what's responsible for the wave of depolarization going down the cell, that depolarization wave moves more quickly. So that increases dromotropy, the speed at which inf, um, depolarization travels through the heart. And the third thing that happens is specifically these calcium channels here work more quickly and they allow more calcium to come in. Now remember from our um, lecture on how depolarization stimulates contraction, it's calcium. Calcium coming through this channel which goes in and heats the deep cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and releases more calcium. So this is the calcium that starts that pathway of the calcium induced calcium release. And we get that wave puff of calcium coming onto the actin and the myosin. And the more calcium that hits the actin and myosin, the more tropomyosin that's pulled off of the actin, and the more the, the motorheads can contract along there, and the more contraction we have. So we have more actin and myosin contracting, which gives us a stronger contraction, and that increases our inotropy. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. That's how this works. That's how somebody can scare you and start to change your chronotropy, your dromotropy, and your inotropy. It's all through the secondary messenger systems that come from the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. That's so cool. I just think it's such a neat system. And this is how it works. This is how that whole system works. So, wow, I'm just enamored of cardiology. I think it's so cool. All right, so now we're going to go on to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is essentially the same thing. So this is a really important concept to understand. This is the final link in that chain of how thoughts can affect uh, inotropy, chronotropy, dromotropy, and irritability. All right, so parasympathetic nervous system, very, very similar. We have a... Oh, I didn't want to talk about the inward rectifying potassium channels. Just ignore this little bit here of that thing, because that, that was too deep. I took it out. Um, so we have muscarinic receptors. Now, we've talked about the fact that uh, the parasympathetic nervous system works primarily on the atria, whereas the sympathetic works primarily on the ventricles. Why is that? Because we have beta-1 receptors all through the heart, but we've got like two to five times more muscarinic receptors 
in the atria than in the ventricles. So we can spit as much acetylcholine as we want as the ventricles, but without muscarinic 2 receptors down there, there's not going to be the secondary cascade that affects all the pumps and exchangers and, and ion channels. So that's why it has to do with how many muscarinic receptors are in the atria versus the ventricle. That's why the parasympathetic nervous system works so well on the atria, because there's way more muscarinic receptors, receptors in the atria than in the ventricles. So what happens when we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system? Well, the secondary messenger systems are going to slow down the pumps and they're going to slow down the exchangers, which means we slow down our heart rate. So parasympathomimetics, drugs that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, will slow down our heart rate. They're negative chronotropes. We'll also slow down these channels, so the exchange will go more slowly. So um, parasympathomimetics are negative dromotropes. They slow down that wave of depolarization. And last thing, of course, is inotropy. We are decreasing the amount of calcium that comes in, so we're decreasing the calcium-induced calcium release, and we're decreasing the total number of actin and myosin that are doing the power stroke in the heart, so the heart beats uh, more weakly. And that's how the parasympathetic nervous system slows down our heart, slows down the rate of contraction, and decreases the strength of contraction. Again, really important to understand. Now, before I jump into the next thing, make sure you understand sympathetic and parasympathetic, because that's the basic idea. Now I'm going to talk about something in a second that's kind of funky, that normally I wouldn't go into, but it's important to understand, to understand how one of our very important cardiac drugs work. And that drug is adenosine. We give adenosine to patients, and we're gonna talk about why. But the basic thing I want you to understand is the sympathetic and parasympathetic effects. And now we're gonna go off just on a slight tangent, which is an important tangent if you give adenosine, to understand why we give adenosine. Because adenosine plays in this area. So we're going to talk about our adenosine triphosphate. So we've got our adenosine here with three inorganic phosphates attached to it. This is our ubiquitous battery in the body. This is fully charged. And when we rip off one of those phosphates, we create energy. When we're under a lot of stress, our heart depletes those batteries. And we go from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate to adenosine monophosphate. And eventually, once we've lost all three inorganic phosphates, we're left with just the adenosine base inside of our heart. And when that adenosine base, when it's just adenosine in our body, um, it has effects on our heart. So uh, we can wait until we've you know, exhausted our heart and used up all of our adenosine and the adenosine triphosphate and we're down to just adenosine to wait for these effects. Or we can squirt adenosine into patients' bloodstreams and then it'll travel to the body and it will exert its effects inside the heart. We've got to do it very quick though because the half-life of adenosine, it picks up phosphates really quickly and deactivates because there's phos inorganic phosphate floating around. So when we give adenosine, we got to get it uh, like through a central line or at least through the anticubital fossa, push it in quickly to the heart, follow it with a really quick flush of fluid so that we can get it to the heart within about 10 seconds so it can start to have its effects. What effects does it have? Let's talk about that. So inside the heart, when we give adenosine, adenosine actually inhibits noradrenaline release from the sympathetic nervous system postganglionic nerve, nerve terminal. So when the cardiac acceleratory center says, hey, hey, speed up, speed up, if there's a lot of adenosine floating around, then it stops that noradrenaline from being released, which means that we're not going to affect our beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which means the secondary messenger systems aren't going to happen, and we're not going to speed up. Uh, we won't have positive inotropy, chronotropy, and dromotropy. If you think about it, that makes sense. If we're working our heart so fast and so hard that uh, we've stripped off all of our phosphates and we're just down to adenosine and there's all these dead batteries floating around, then the dead batteries create this local feedback system that say, stop, just stop, slow down. You're working too hard. No more noradrenaline for you. You're not allowed to have any more. We're going to slow you down. 
So it's this sort of um, uh, like a safety system that stops the heart from overworking. So that's what adenosine does. It stops this release of noradrenaline. It also, in addition to stopping the noradrenaline, stops the secondary messenger system, or at least inhibits it, so that we don't get the, the pumps and exchangers and, and voltage-gated ion channels and the funny channels. The funny channels are important because that's why we use adenosine. We'll get to that in a second. So it acts as a sympatholytic, something that cuts the sympathetic nervous system and slows the heart down. So adenosine also increases the amount of uh, potassium that goes out of the cell and decreases the calcium influx, which means that the inside of the cell becomes much more negative compared to the outside. So we say it's hyperpolarized. And this happens mostly, interestingly enough, in the AV node. So if we have a problem in the heart where the atria are firing really quickly and hitting that AV node, and the AV node is going zap, 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 zap to the ventricles, and this we have a superventricularly driven tachycardia, the way we can slow that down is by pushing in a whole bunch of dead batteries, pushing in a whole bunch of adenosine, and fooling the heart into thinking that it's got no batteries left and when the heart has no batteries left, it says, okay, no more noradrenaline, no more secondary messenger systems, no more calcium influx, just everybody calm down because we're running out of energy. So we push in some adenosine, and in fact, it can actually stop the AV node from conducting entirely for up to 30 seconds. So when we give adenosine to a patient who's in a, you know, a, a hypotension-inducing supraventricular tachycardia, it stops this ability for the sympathetic nervous system to work and actually blocks the AV node. And I've given adenosine to patients, and they've gone, because it's really uncomfortable. They describe this, I love this phrase, the sense of impending doom. People panic when you give them adenosine. In fact, it's so uncomfortable that I've seen patients who have supraventricular tachycardias, we've walked in as paramedics and they go, no adenosine. <laughs> okay, because it's really a horrible feeling. And you can push the adenosine in and then the patient goes asystolic for like 10, 20, up to 30 seconds. I never had 30 seconds. But let me tell you, you walk into a patient who's alive and breathing and a little bit uncomfortable, you give them a drug and they go, oh, and they turn red and then they fall on the bed and they're asystolic. That is, that is a sphincter tightening moment. You are really concerned when you give adenosine and you're waiting there going, this is normal, it's okay, this is normal. And hopefully they go from doop, 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 and come back into a normal sort of rhythm. Adenosine is the physiological, biological equivalent of turning it off and turning it on again to see if you can get it to work properly. So that's why we give adenosine. So it, it acts as an internal cardioprotective emergency brake. In effect, it works like the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is too active, so normally what we do is we'd enhance the parasympathetic nervous system and or block the sympathetic nervous system to switch the balance, to slow the heart down. But what adenosine does is it short circuits both of that and it actually blocks the sympathetic nervous system without activating the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's a sympathetic nervous system blocker, an SNS blocker, which allows the parasympathetic nervous system to become ascendant. So that's why we give adenosine. Interestingly, adenosine, all these dead batteries floating around, is possibly part of the nociceptive pathway, the pain pathway. Nociception is um, perception of pain for angina. So Oops, I spelled angina wrong. <laughs> angina. It's supposed to be A-N-G-I-N-A. -A. Sorry about that. I'll correct that later. Um, that'll be corrected in the one I post up to the to SlideShare. So I just noticed that after years of teaching this. Yeah, you keep learning. Anyway, when people have that crushing, squeezing feeling of angina, we think possibly that the reason for that is that the adenosine is stimulating the pain nerves and sending the pain signal to the brain. So that's why adenosine hurts so much when we give it to people and why they have this sense of impending doom because we're stimulating a lot of the pain pathways, we think. All right? So adenosine. If adenosine is a part of your scope of practice and you're giving it, you should understand this. You should understand how adenosine works. You should understand what you're doing in the heart physiologically. All righty? So quick review. Sympathetic nervous system speeds things up. 
by activating the secondary messenger system. Parasympathetic system slows things down by activating those secondary messenger systems to inhibit. And adenosine uh, is a blocker for the, para for the sympathetic nervous system, which allows the sympathetic nervous system to become ascendant. But we're not actually turning on the sympathetic nervous system. We're just turning off the sympathetic temporarily, which allows the parasympathetic to take over. Okay? Really important concept to understand. So here it is. Finally, we've gone, oh, there it is. We've gone all the way from things happening inside and outside of our body, which causes our brain to either speed up along here or slow down along here our heart rate by releasing noradrenaline and stimulating beta-1 receptors or releasing acetylcholine and stimulating muscarinic 2 receptors, mostly in the atria. And that affects all of this other stuff, which we've already talked about. And that's how we go from a thought to bradycardia or tachycardia or positive or negative inotropy. That's how the whole thing connects. This is the, you know, the 15,000 meter view from the airplane of the entire process. Again, if you understand this diagram, then you really, really understand the electrophysiology of the heart, going all the way from the outside down to the molecular level on the inside. Really important concept to understand. All right. Um, and then here's the summary of adenosine, that kind of special case of adenosine blocking the noradren uh, noradrenaline and inhibiting the calcium channel and inhibiting the secondary messenger systems. Boom. So that's a big lecture. There's a lot of information in that one, but it's really, really good information. And it's an exciting sort of conclusion to uh, understanding how all of this stuff works. If you understand that bit, you really, really get it. So what we're going to do in the next lecture is we're going to talk about how you can alter that using different drugs, using different pharmacological agents. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments or send me a letter, contact at paramedicine.com. I take a look at that regularly and I do answer the comments in the comments section. I look at that fairly regularly too. I get a notification when someone comments. And I'm happy to discuss this stuff because obviously I'm kind of a nerd and I really love it. So comments, criticisms, corrections, commendations, whatever you have, feel free to leave those in. And I'll see you in, whenever you're ready, to take a look at that last lecture that talks about pharmacology.